Um, start from the current slide. Whatever. Wake up here. I don't think this is actually where we're beginning today because we've already done that one and that one. That one, that one. I don't know why we started. Ah, that's where we start today. But before we get started on that, let me make a few announcements. There's none uh, too crucial that I know about now, school-wise. But I've got a weird week coming up. Okay, showing sure. that. Okay. Okay. All right. Next week is going to be strange, okay? Um, Tuesday of next week, it will affect this class a little bit, but more than I wish it would. But uh, I think I told you early in the term that I have a mild form of leukemia, so I have to see my hematologist periodically and they've scheduled, and he only sees patients on Tuesday mornings, okay? I can't schedule them any other time, and they schedule them anyway. And they schedule me for next Tuesday, I think at either 1020 or 1040. I don't remember which. 1040, I think it is. But I have to be there for blood work at 940, which means I'll have to leave here by 9 o'clock. So next Tuesday, we'll only meet for about a half hour, and then the rest of it, I think you'll probably need to get off of YouTube video from the last time we met. Okay. Now, we are awfully close to finishing 1.9. When we finish 1.9, we're supposed to have the test on chapter 1. I was wondering if y'all would object if we postponed the test uh, until next Thursday. Name, please. Huh? I thought so. Um, anyway, I, I marked you here earlier. I was psychotic. I mean, psychic. Uh, I knew you were coming. Okay. Got you down there. So, and the reason for that is next Thursday, and again, this is something that was scheduled for me. I signed up for a retirement seminar, and they chose the date, and it's the only choice I have, and it's next Thursday. Not the day after tomorrow, Thursday, but the following Thursday. So I will be gone all day that day. So, are y'all okay with having the test then? And I'll just try to find somebody else to come in here and talk to the test. Probably Dr. Thomas, I'm guessing. But if not Dr. Thomas, I'll get someone in here. Because I know she's here on, on th Tuesdays and Thursdays on this campus. Uh, uh, when does that team come back? What's that? When does that team come back and take the test? Uh, no. Okay. It, it, I'll be here Thursday, so if you want to take the test, we can have it Thursday. Uh, this coming Thursday, the day after tomorrow. So, okay. So let's, uh, I'll get somebody to come here and talk to the test. I'll let them know that y'all are allowed to have a formula equation sheet, and uh, I. <coughs> Um, the test, I know sometimes is a bit on the long side. If there's some questions you can't get, especially toward the end, just write on the top something like you'll return or, you know, not finished or something like that. I will grade what you uh, have completed so far, but I'll leave the ones you have blank, blank, and you can come back and finish those later. So don't and turn them in, uh, but write that on the top so I'll know you didn't just give up that you are going to come back. So, uh, and you can't have formula and equation sheets, so please work that up and get that, have that ready to go. Of course, you can have calculators. I'll have graph paper if you need it. If you prefer your own graph paper, you can bring it. Uh, scratch paper is highly encouraged uh, because if I find you did something right on scratch paper, I can at least give partial credit, and sometimes if you had the right answer and you just wrote it wrong on, on the test, I'll give you full credit. So I encourage you to turn in your scratch paper work as well. Okay? So 
next week is a kind of a, a sad week. We'll only have a little bit of class on Tuesday, and then you'll have your test on Thursday. Uh, but I won't be there for that. So I'll find somebody to come and talk to you. Uh, it's about 20. I don't remember if it's exactly 20, but uh, you know your quiz is about 10 questions on one page. Your test is two pages like that. Uh, the first page covers a lot of the same material that the quiz covers, the first three sections. Probably a few questions at the bottom of that that are from the next three sections, and then the second page is mostly the uh, next three sections. So it's about double the size of your quiz. Which leads me to the uh, thing. This class has been very good. Which I may be John. I mean, I'm not, I didn't say that. Did I? I said uh, if John's here uh, about getting quizzes in. I only missing one, two, three, four, five, six. Okay, out of a class of 29, that's not too bad. Okay, or 28 now, I guess it is. One person never showed. Uh, so please. If you haven't turned in your quiz, please get me your quiz today, tomorrow, Thursday. Oh, here's the other announcement. I forgot to make this one. Remember last week I told you I was going to be out of town basically all day Friday of last week. We left at 6 in the morning. We actually got back earlier than expected, 3.30, but that was basically all day out of town. Um, and because that was a nine and a half hour day and I'm only supposed to work four hours on Friday, I asked my boss if I could have this Friday off as well. He said, sure. So I'm not going to be on campus again this Friday either. So, uh, so get me the quiz today, tomorrow, or Thursday, or Monday, and please try to get it to me no later than Tuesday morning. Um, I would love to return all the quizzes to you Thursday or Tuesday morning before the test. But if you don't have them all turned in, I can't return them. You can always see them, but I can't return them until they all come in. So please get your quizzes in as soon as you can so I can get them back to you before the test, or at least you can see them before the test to see what you missed. I think all the grades are in Blackboard now. Hopefully you can find those. And, uh, but yes. Okay. You have to have at least one outside source. Okay. Two or more are better. Okay. And yeah, but they have to be outside the book. The book can give you plenty of good ideas, but your your research the sources have to be not the book, somewhere else. Okay. Does that answer your what you're asking? Okay, good deal. Any other questions before we get going? Okay. Um, and by the way, since I won't be here next Thursday, week after, day after tomorrow, uh, your test will count as your, your role. So uh, whatever test you turn in, that indicates your presence here, because I have to put role down. If you are not here for the test, you're, not, you're counted as absent, whatever that matters. <laughs> but usually that only matters early in the term, but I do have to mark role every day. All right, any other questions? All right. Last time we're in uh, section 1.9. Chapter 1 is still functions in the grass. 1.9 is inverse functions. And it, for a function to have an inverse, it has to be a one-to-one -one function. One-to-one -one function. That's what we're going to talk about now. Uh, we kind of have led up to this, but maybe not use this terminology. This reflective property of the graphs of inverse functions gives you a geometric test for determining whether a function has an inverse or not. Now, remember what our test was to determine if an expression, a relation, is a function. What's the test we use to see if it is a function? Vertical line test. Okay? Now, since for a function to have an inverse, we said it had to be strictly increasing or strictly decreasing because 
and its reflection across the horizontal x, I mean the uh, uh, identity function, y is equal to x, is also either increasing or decreasing depending on what the function is. So since to be a one, wrong term, since it has to be strictly increasing or decreasing, there's a second test that we can have to see if the function is what we call one, has an inverse. And that is the horizontal line test. Because you see, a function can't back up on itself. A function can, that's no problem. But then if you did the inverse of this, that would then do, look like this. And that would not be a function because it would fail the vertical line test. So therefore, a function, in order to have an inverse, it not only has to pass the vertical line test, it also has to pass the horizontal line test, because this inverse function, if it backs up on itself, if it intersected itself more than once horizontally, which was okay to be a function, but now it can't have an inverse that way. So this is called the horizontal line test for inverse functions. So here's what it is. A function f has an inverse function if and only if no horizontal line intersects the graph of the alpha at more than one point. Just like the vertical line test determines whether it's a function, the horizontal line test determines whether it has an inverse or not. Okay? If it crosses uh, the, uh, the horizontal line intersects the graph at more than one point, then on that interval it does not have a, an inverse. Now, what we can do is restrict our interval to places where it only crosses once. And we'll get to that a little bit later. Okay? So, if no horizontal line intersects the graph F at more than one point, then no Y value is matched with more than one X value. Now, to be a function, you can't have, for any given X value, more than one Y. Okay, but now to be past the vertical line test, I mean the horizontal line test, no y value can have more than one x. Okay, so this is a essential characteristic that we call a one to one function. If there's an x, there's one and only one y. If there's a y, there's only one and, one and only one x. That means a one to one function. So here's the one to one function. Function f is one to one when each value of the dependent variable, y, corresponds to exactly one value of the independent variable we've been calling x. A function that f has an inverse function if and only if it is one-to-one. -one. So if it passes a horizontal line test, it has to be one-to-one. -one. It will have an inverse. If it's one-to-one, -one, it's got to pass the horizontal line test. Okay? These are all saying the same thing. But uh, this is the name of the function. The other is the test. Does that kind of make sense? Okay. I think someone snuck in while I wasn't looking. Okay. Great. All right. Anyone else sneak in while I wasn't looking? Okay. So a few people still writing, so I'll let you get this down. Any questions so far? Is this making sense? Okay. For those who just came in, uh, we were talking about possibly having the test this Thursday if we finish 1.9. Now I suggested and the class sort of agreed to postpone it till next Thursday, not the day after tomorrow, but the following Thursday. Uh, the main reason is I'm going to be out of town that week. I've got to go to Tuscaloosa that Thursday, so I will have someone else come in and give the test that day. So we'll go on and get started in Chapter 2, but Chapter 2 just builds on Chapter 1, so it's not going to be distracting anything. It'll actually be building. Okay, everybody got it? Okay. So consider a function given by f of x equal x squared. Number one, is that a function? Sure it is. For any x, there's only one y. Pick an x, square it, you only get one y. Okay? Now, the table over here 
shows the value for f of x equal x squared. You put in a minus 2, minus 2 squared is what? Say again? 4 minus 1 squared? 0 squared? 1 squared? 2 squared? 3 squared? 9. Okay. Now, this is a function. Vertical line test is passed. Okay? What would happen if you flipped it? If you exchange the x's and the y's. Okay? That's what you do when you're trying to do an inverse. Well, then this would be 4, negative 2, 1, negative 1, 0, 0, 1, 1, 4, 2, and 9, 3. Is that a function? No, because here you have two fours here with different y's. Same x, different y's. Not a function. Fail the vertical line test. Okay. Also here, you have one negative one. Here you have one positive one. Fails the vertical line test. Okay. Which, if you went back here, this would have failed the horizontal line test. Because this is a parabola, and parabolas don't meet the horizontal line test. So this is this is a function, but it's not a function with an inverse. Not the way it's described here. Now here's the catch. We could limit the domain of this function to positive numbers. Then this would be a one-to-one -one function. It would have an inverse. Or we could limit this to negative numbers. And that would still have be a one-to-one -one function. It would have an inverse. But when we do not limit the domain, it's not a function because it fails the horizontal line test. Okay, does that make sense? All right. That table on the right does not represent a function because the input say 4 gave 2 outputs, negative 2 and positive 2, so did 1. 1 gave 2 outputs, positive 1 and negative 1. So the function f of x is not 1 to 1, does not have an inverse, fails the horizontal line test, unless you restrict the domain so it does uh, pass the horizontal line test. But we haven't gotten there yet. I'm just telling you you can do it. So here's an example. Here's the graph of f of x is equal to x cubed minus 1. Okay? Do you think that's a uh, function has an inverse? Okay, I've drawn the graph for you. Do you think it might have an inverse? Yes. Why? Passes the horizontal line test. No horizontal line intersects more than one. Okay? Um, that makes it what kind of function? One to one function. Excellent. Okay? It's also, they haven't talked about this much, so I think they will later, it's strictly increasing. That makes it one to one. That makes it um, uh, have an inverse. Okay? Now, we know it has one, but we, have, we don't know how to find that out. That's coming up. Because no horizontal line intersects the graph of this function at more than one point, f is one to one, it does have an inverse function. Okay? Now, should have started with this. If you had remembered what your parent function was, the cubic function, that would have gone like this, and then a minus one shifts it down. Uh, vertical shift down with one, so it's still a good one-to-one -one function. Okay. How about this one? What's your rule on that one? F of x is equal to x squared minus one. A good function. Vertical line says passes. Is it one-to-one? -one? No. Horizontal line test fails. Okay. Does it have an inverse? No, because the one is not one-to-one, one, okay? Vertical line test fails. Now, what 
what did you do to make it pass? Leave off this side. Have your domain be zero to positive infinity. Or leave off this side to have your domain be negative infinity to zero. Either one of those would give you a one-to-one -one function on a restricted domain. Okay? But the way it's written, the way it's drawn, not one-to-one. -one. Does not have an input. Because it's possible to find a horizontal line, in fact, bunches of horizontal lines intersects the graph at more than one point, uh, else is not one-to-one, -one, does not have an input. Good deal. Any questions? Okay. That was example five. Now, how do we find these inverse functions algebraically? We talked about them in the first part, and for really easy ones, we... Say again. Howard? Hamilton. Hamilton, got it. Okay. My hearing's bad. You're for hearing, right? There's another Hamilton that was already here. Okay. All right. Now, I said, trying to remember to say this every time someone new comes in. Uh, we were talking about possibly having the exam, maybe the first test, maybe on this Thursday. But because I've got to be out of town next Thursday, the class decided they'd rather take the exam when I'm not here. Well, no, they just said they'd rather take the test on next Thursday. So we're going, the test will not be this week. Will not be Tuesday of next week, but will be Thursday of next week. Okay? And I'll get someone in here to proctor the exam. Okay. Probably Dr. Thomas, but if not, I'll find somebody. Okay. And we will continue. We'll probably finish hopefully 1.9 today and go on and start on, on uh, 2.1. And we'll continue with that on Thursday. And a little bit on the next Tuesday morning. But in addition to all that, please, if you haven't turned in the first quiz, please get the first quiz in as soon as you can. So hopefully I can return it to you before the test. Uh, but if not all of them are in, I can only let you see it, but I can't return it to you. So you, if you turn it in now, you can see it anytime you want to. Uh, but I have to keep it until I get them all in. All right. So we started the section finding some really easy inverses by inspection, by observation, how do we do it algebraically, especially for those that are a bit more complicated, okay? For relatively simple functions, such as the one we did, example one, I think it was f of x equal 4x or something like that, you can find inverse functions by inspection. For more complicated functions, however, it's best to use the following guidelines that are coming up on the next slide. Now, they say here the key step in these guidelines is step three, okay? I don't like the way they number them. I'll tell you what I would do. It still is the key step, but I don't call it step three anymore. Interchanging the roles of x and y. That's what inverse functions do. They flip the x and the y. So that step corresponds to the fact that inverse functions have ordered pairs with the coordinates reversed. That's why they have to be one-to-one. -one. So here are the steps. Now, again, I don't necessarily agree with all these. Okay, finding an inverse function. The first thing you, might, you need to do is make sure that it has an inverse, okay? In order to have an inverse, it's got to be one-to-one. -one. And the test to determine one-to-one -one is the horizontal line test. Does that mean you have to graph the function? Well, it helps sometimes, but sometimes you can think your way through it. And I'd rather think my way through it than graph it sometimes. If you have a graphing calculator, which is not required for the course, but if you have one, then you can probably punch it in on that and see if the horizontal line test is, is passed. Okay? But anyway, you got to do something to make sure it does have an inverse. If it doesn't, don't waste your time. It doesn't have an inverse. Okay. Now, next step. Really easy one. In the equation, instead of f of x, put y. 
And that's what we had from the beginning of the term. What is alpha vec? Why? So that that's what we do. What we've been saying in the beginning, uh, when you have an equation for alpha vec, just replace the alpha vec with y, because that's what it is. Okay? Now, I agree. It is step three still. I would break this into two steps, though. Step three, flip the x's and y's. Okay? Just exchange them. Whatever was x, make it y. Whatever was y, make it x. Then I would say step four, solve for y. I don't know why they put the two most important steps in one step. Interchange the roles, then solve for y. Okay? Once you solve for y, then y becomes the f inverse. Y started out being f, but when you flip them, it becomes the f inverse. Okay? Now, and, you know, this whole process is not too bad. It can get a little interesting solving for y and stuff like this, but it's a pretty straightforward process. But step five, which I call step six, verify that they're inverse functions of each other, and they say by, number one, taking f of f inverse, making sure that's equal to x, and remember that's what it has to be, and then take f inverse of f and make sure that's equal to x, okay? Don't verify, you may have made a mistake somewhere up here and you've gotten the wrong answer, so you do need to verify. That's completely up to you, but uh, I always like to check my work, and this is a way to do it. Now, the other thing to show that the domain of f is equal to the range of f inverse, and usually that's pretty obvious, the range of f is equal to the domain of f inverse, usually you don't have to do much of that to help observe it, but these are actually the sort of things you need to do. Okay? So let's do example six. Now here is a problem, folks. The example six that's in your text is not the example six that's on the slide. So do you want to do the one in your text, or you want to do the one on the slide, or you want to do both of them? No. Both. So let's do the one on the slide first, and then we'll come back and do the one on the text. Okay? So, anyone remember step one? Say again. A little louder. Okay, you got to make sure it is. Now. I can handle this one without the horizontal line test, okay? Well, yeah, I'm going, I'm going to think through the horizontal line test. What kind of function is this? Well, it may help this way. Can we rewrite this function anyway? Yes, how would we rewrite it? Let me get my pen set up, okay? Would that not be the same as 5 over 2 minus 3 halves? X? Yay or nay? Perfect. Okay. What kind of function is that? Say again. Okay. It will have an inverse, but we're trying to determine that. What kind of function is that? Hint, look at the maximum exponent. The only exponent. One. And any function, the only exponent is... One, what kind of function is it? Linear function, right? Okay. Now, a linear function, remember? This is why we did those things. A linear function, as long as, that, what do we call these numbers then? If that's a linear function, what would this be? The coefficient of your x? It's a slope, okay? Who cares about the y-intercept right now? The slope, okay? The slope is negative 3 halves. What does that tell you? It's going downhill. Greater than 1, but not too much greater than 1. Slope of down 3 for every 2 across 3, right? So guess what? That's a 1 to 1 function, isn't it? Straight line going downhill. So I'll only be in this x by the horizontal line test. So I don't have to draw the function. I can look at it and say, that's a linear function. The slope is not zero. If the slope was zero, is that a one-to-one uh, -one function? 
No, because the horizontal line crosses everywhere because it is a horizontal line. Okay? But as long as that slope is not zero, then that's a one-to-one uh, -one function. Okay? So we've done step one. Without drawing a graph. You could draw a graph if you wanted to. It's not hard to do, but you could draw it. Okay? So step one's done. What's step two? Anyone recall? Okay, instead of f of x, we put y is equal to 5 minus 3x over 2. I'm going back to the other way. It's uh, probably easier to do now just keeping coefficients as whole numbers. Okay, what's step 3a, the first part of 3? Say again? Exchange them. Okay, make the x's y's and the y x. So this would be, you tell me what to write. x equal 5 minus 3y over 2. Good deal. What's the next part of that step? Solve for y. So we need to solve for y. What's the first step in isolating that y? Solving for y. <laughs> yes, multiply both sides of the equation by 2 to get rid of that denominator. Multiply this by 2 and that by 2. There goes that 2, and there we have it. So our next step, that step yielded 2x is equal to 5 minus 3y. I like the look of that a lot better, don't you? Now we still want to solve for y. So what's the next step we're going to do? What? Okay, now 3 is multiplied by the y. Adding is going to mess it up. Say again? Subtract 5 from both sides. Okay, that sounds like a capital idea. That gives us 2x minus 5 is equal to a minus 3y. Perfect. Now what? Again? Say again? By what? By what? negative 3. Take the sign with it. Okay, divide both sides by negative 3. Okay, let's see what we've got now. Here the negative 3's go out. You get y is equal to minus, you can write it any way you want to. I prefer it this way. Minus 2 thirds x plus 5 thirds. Do you see that? You could leave it in the form they had it. Um, that's a correct answer. Here's a correct answer. Y is equal to 5 minus 2X over 3. That's a correct answer. Or the way we had it down here. So this is a correct answer. That's a correct answer. That's a correct answer. They're all saying the same thing. They're just written in different ways. Now, if y'all were doing web assign, they only recognize one answer as being correct, even though you can write it several different ways. So that is what makes WebAssign so frustrating to me. They tell you an answer is wrong when it's actually correct. Okay? So, any one of those forms will work. Okay? Now, let's see which form they used in the book. Oh, but this isn't in the book. Okay, I forgot that. This one's not. Okay, and what's the next to the last step? Say again? Yeah. Change the y to f inverse. Which one do you want to use? The first one down here, the second one here, or the third one there? I don't care. First one. Okay. So we'll say f inverse of x is equal to, now that's not a minus sign, that was just a thing indicating, is equal to 2x minus 5 over negative perfectly fine. All right, what about that last step? Okay, time out for just a moment here. Let's go to this form, which I kind of like. What kind of function is this? Linear function. What can you tell me about it? The slope is negative. 
And remember, this one has a negative slope. Remember, if one is going downhill, the other one's going downhill. Okay? So they both have negative slopes. Now, very different y-intercepts, that's okay. No problem there. But uh, they both have negative slopes. And that's kind of important. And that one is a little harder to tell, but still true. Okay, but what is that last guy? Verify. How do you do that? Okay, yeah. We're, we're going to assume that's okay. What's the last part? Okay, first we have to do f of f inverse and then f inverse of f. Woo, these are going to take a while. So let's try it. What you want to do first? Say again. F of f inverse of x. Okay. So which you put in first? This is a review. The innermost. So leave the F out here and put in what is F inverse. Well, there it is right above there. What is that? 2X minus 5 over negative 3. Okay? Now, we're going to operate on that thing with F. Well, you go back to the F, and here's, the, here's your F right here. Okay? So what F does, it starts with the number... What does the F function start with? 5. So this will be 5 minus 3 times whatever is inside the parentheses, right? What's inside the parentheses? 2X minus 5 over negative 3. And then it divides all that by 2, right? Now. Just a little note here. Notice here the threes divide out. Three over three is one. The signs minus and minus become plus. So what we have left in the numerator is five plus two X minus five. And what we have left in the denominator is two. What happens to that? The fives. Five minus five is zero. And you're left with two X over two, which is X. And that's exactly what you want to have. X. Because the inverse undoes the function. And the function undoes the inverse. So we're halfway there. <laughs> Yet only halfway there. I'm going to have to erase some stuff to make more room. Is that okay? All right. So I'm going to erase this down here since we're not using them. Uh, we could have used those, but we're not. So we'll use what we had because this is what Keelan wanted to use. Okay. So the next test is which? F inverse of F of X. Okay. Which do we plug in first? The F, okay, the innermost function. So leave the F inverse out there. And what is your F of X? 5 minus 3X over 2. And that's what F inverse is going to operate on. So where does F inverse begin? Starts with a 2 times whatever is in the parentheses. And what's in the parentheses? 5 minus 3x over 2, and then it subtracts 5 from that, and then it divides by negative 3, right? So let's start working. What would you do first? Wait, 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 yeah. Let's do this. The 2s disappear, right? 1, 2's in the numerator, 1's in the denominator, 2 over 2 is 1. Let's do the easy part first, okay? So what does that leave your numerator to be? 
5 minus 3x minus 5, and your denominator is negative 3. Let that take care of itself. What's the next thing we notice? 5 minus 5 is 0. And then we see that negative 3 over negative 3 is 1, and we're left with an x. Ding, ding, ding. We got it. F of F inverse was F. It was X, and F inverse of X of F was X. So yes, we verified it both ways. Okay? And it wasn't too bad, was it? Say yes. No. What is it? Okay. All right. Everybody got that one? The example six that wasn't example six? Okay. So let's do the example six that is example six. Does anyone need this a little longer for your writing? I'll leave it as long as you need it. Got it? Okay. Even if you don't have it, I'm going to erase it, and you can see how they did it. Is that okay? Okay. So let's see if they did it any differently than I. Okay? Oh, no. <laughs> the function they show here is not the same function. It's the one that's in the book. Back off from that. Sorry, if I, I've already erased it, but uh, hopefully you got it. Sorry, I didn't realize they screwed it up. The one they have is the one that is in the book. So let me wipe out this one and write the correct one. 5 minus x over 3x plus 2. This will be just a little more challenging, but still okay. Okay? Now, the other one was a linear function. We knew it was one-to-one. -one. This is not a linear function. And I kind of am a little angry at them because they're giving you a function we haven't even done yet. This is one called a rational function. Okay? I'm going to tell you how to approach a rational function. This one we almost do have to do the graph, but not exactly. I mean, you don't have to, but it's really going to help to. So let's do the graph. Okay? Now. There's several places that you could begin, and it doesn't matter which one. But I'll tell you where I usually begin. Because this has a variable in the denominator, I worry about zeros in the denominator. So I want to find out the place that makes that denominator zero. Because I know the denominator can't be zero. So what would we do? <laughs> Say 3x minus 2 cannot equal zero. Remember, you can never divide by zero, right? Yay? Okay. So let's solve that inequality. What does that give us? How would you do that? Add two to both sides. Okay, that wipes out that. You get 3x cannot equal negative two. No, positive two. And then what? Divide by three. And X cannot equal two-thirds. Well, let me tick off a few points here. One, two, three, four, five. Negative one, two, three, four, five. Positive one, two, three, four, five. And negative one, two, three, four. Okay, we don't put five. Okay. Positive two-thirds. Notice I'm going down here and making a red line here. That's somewhere right about there, right? That red line is x equal two-thirds. We know it can never equal two-thirds, so I'm drawing a red line there saying you can't touch or cross that line ever because that would make your denominator zero. All right. Now, I'm going to do something else, and it looks a little bizarre, but I'm going to do it. Okay? We'll be doing this... Uh, later when we get at the end of chapter two, I'm going to rewrite this to be negative x plus five over three x plus two. Is that legal in most states? I didn't change anything, I just rewrote, the, changed the order of the numerator. Same thing, right? Now, we haven't done this yet, but I'm gonna tell you now. This, by the way, this red line, vertical red line, is called a vertical asymptote. That means the function cannot touch it, cannot uh, cross it, ever. 
can get close, but can never touch. Okay? Why I rewrote this is now, if you look at the ratio of the leading terms, we haven't done this yet. What is the ratio of the leading terms? Negative one-third, because the x's go out, right? Okay? What that tells you is the horizontal asymptote. So again, I'm going to go red on this. Negative one-third is going to be down here somewhere. And that would be y is equal to that. Okay? That's your horizontal asymptote. Now, the difference between a vertical and a horizontal asymptote, a vertical asymptote cannot be touched or crossed. A horizontal asymptote, that just tells you what happens in the long run. You can cross or touch it back here, but in the long run, it's going to be approaching it. So that's what we know there. Okay? Now, those are the first two things we're going to do. I'm going back to black here. And I'm going to get, whoops, also going to do some erasing here. Okay, because that may be a little confusing. Uh, I'm going to write this in as horizontal asymptote, one-third. Y is equal to negative one-third. Okay. Now, the next thing I look for is where is on my intercepts, my x-intercept and my y-intercept, okay? Anyone know what an x-intercept is? It's where the function crosses the x-axis, x-intercept. X-axis intercepts the function. It's like Nick Saban's defensive backs do, right? Okay, never mind. All right, I said that to the Alabama fan over here. All right, now, um, what is true about an x-intercept? It's on the x-axis. What's true about every point on the x-axis? What coordinate is always the same for every point on the x-axis? Y is equal to zero, because it's neither up or down. So y is equal to zero. Well, what's our y? thing you ought to know. What is y? f of x. Okay. So what we're going to do is say y is equal to 5 minus x over 3x plus 2. Either form will be fine for this. Okay. Now if this is equal to 0, how is the only way this is equal to 0 if this is a fractional form? The only way to get y to be 0 is is if the numerator is zero. So that comes from saying five minus x is equal to zero. Okay? And solve that equation. Subtract five from both sides. That's okay to do. That would give us minus x is equal to minus five. And then divide both sides by minus 1, or multiply by both sides by minus 1, whatever, you get x equal 5. That's your x-intercept. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. Goodness, that's way out there. Okay? There's your x-intercept. Now, what's the other intercept? That's the x-intercept. The y-intercept. What's true about every y-intercept? Every point on here, what's true about that? x is equal to 0. So let's put a 0 in for x. Okay? Let's do it right here. Like a 0 here and a 0 there. What does the y become? What's left? 5 over 2. That's 2 and a half, isn't it? 1, 2 and a half. There's your y intercept right there. Okay? I did something wrong, didn't I? No, I didn't. It's okay. Yes, I, no. Something's bizarre here. Horizontal asymptote is down there. That's right. Vertical asymptote 
Oh, I'm sorry, they're not doing that. I think I got vertical asymptote wrong. I think I did it right. I see what I did. I wrote the function down. I mean, I wrote this down wrong. I said 3x minus 2 here. That's supposed to be a plus. Okay, so y'all were supposed to catch me on that. Y'all are letting me make mistakes. What is wrong with you guys? Okay. Okay. X cannot be negative 2 thirds because it was 3x plus 2 was my denominator, not 3x minus 2. Look at you. Okay. I need to erase this vertical asymptote because that's in the wrong place. Oh, I just erased my whole line. Okay. Sorry about this, folks. Okay. Get my x-axis back in there. And my vertical asymptote is x cannot equal negative two-thirds. So that I'm going to put here. Negative two-thirds is over here. Okay. Now I know we're okay. This tells us one thing. Only one thing. Okay? And that is if the function has to cross here and here, can't cross the vertical asymptote or even touch it, going to be approaching the horizontal asymptote, here's what it's doing. The function is doing like this here, like this here, and going to town there. We don't know beans about what's happening on the left-hand side. So here we have to choose a test point. Looks like a good test point would be x equal minus 1. So let's use that. x equal minus 1. All right. So let's do f of minus 1. We'll use this form here. That would be 5 minus a minus 1 over 3 times a, help me, minus 1 plus 2. Okay? Well, what's 5 minus a minus 1? 5 plus 1 is 6, and 3 times a minus 1 is, say again, negative 3, right? Plus, one, plus 2 is 1. No, it's minus 1. Negative 3 plus 2 is minus 1. I'm not doing very well today. So what is this alpha minus 1? Negative 6, right? Whoops, that's off scale. Somewhere down here, right? Way down there, okay? That tells you where we are. We're somewhere in this sector. Get out of here. Sector here. Okay, whoa. You can't cross that, touch that vertical asymptote. And it approaches horizontal asymptote. So here's what our function looks like. It looks like this here, that there. Okay, this point here. Okay, I didn't get a second one. All I did was get one point here and then say I know it can't touch this line and it's going to be approaching this line so it has to stay in between there. All I need is one point over here. All I needed was one point up there. It just happened both my intercepts are in that one, so that's fine. All I needed was one here because it has to stay within that sector. Okay, so when I found out it was in this sector, then it has to stay within that. Now, all that, all that was just to determine, is this a one-to-one -one function? Is it? Yeah, because vertical, I mean horizontal as line cast that passes everywhere, right? So yep, one-to-one. That was step one. <laughs> okay. Whoa. Okay. And this is a little convoluted. But anyway, we've determined it is a one to one function, so it does have an inverse. So now we proceed to step two. Now I'm going to erase everything and write the function back again. Is that okay? 
Y'all got the graph? Okay. So let's erase this, and we'll go back to what we had before. This was uh, 5 minus x over 3x plus 2. Okay. We've done step one, which was verify it's one to one. It is. Pass the horizontal line test. What's step two? Really easy step. Say again? Yes, instead of f of inverse, we put it y. So now we have y is equal to 5 minus x over 3x plus 2. Okay, that was easy. The first part of the third step is easy. What was it? Flip them. Okay, and what does that become? x equal 5 minus y over 3y plus 2. Fantastic. Now what's that last little bit of step 3? That's why I say this should be a new step. Solve for y. Uh-oh, SpaghettiOs. How in the world are we going to solve that for y? What would be your first step? What do you not like about the way that's written? Well, I can tell this class loves their fractions, don't they? Okay, you have a denominator, period. How do you get rid of that denominator? No, it's already divided. Multiply by 3y plus 2. That'll get rid of it, won't it? But if you multiply that side by 3y plus 2, you also have to multiply this side by 3y plus 2. Someone didn't leave enough room, did he? Okay. So on this side, you wipe out the denominator. Let's write this a little bit better. x times 3y plus 2 is equal to 5 minus y. Got it? Okay. Now, what's the next step? Still can't solve for y, but what can you do? Distribute? Yeah, that's what we're thinking, okay. And what does that become? Help me. 3xy plus 2x is equal to 5 minus y. Okay. Now we still, our goal is to solve for y. So what might be a good idea? You know your y's together. I like them on this side. Is that okay with you? Now that means anything without a y, get to the other side. So how are we going to do this? Say again, add a y to both sides. Okay, we'll do that. And we also need to subtract the 2x from both sides. Okay, now what happens there? The 2x's go out here, the y's go out there. So what do we have left? I'm going to write it up here. 3xy plus y, that's everything on the left-hand side. On the right-hand side, 5 minus 2x. Hey. Now we still, what's the goal? Solve for y. So what should we do now? Another way for solving for y, isolate the y. Get it by itself. So what might you do? Anybody? What's the f word? Factor. Let's try it. Factor out the y. You got all of them over there, right? Factor them out what you have left. 3x plus 1. And on this side, just leave that alone. 5 minus 2x. Now we're wanting to isolate the y, so what might we do? What does this mean, to have the y written next to the parentheses? Ah, we divide by 3x plus 1. Divide this side by 3x plus 1. 
Now if this wipes out, hey, there we have it. Y is equal to 5 minus 2x over 3x plus 1. Now you see why I said that little thing at the end there when it says solve for y, it should be its own step. I mean, this, this all was solving for y. Once we got to this stage right here, the rest of it was solving for y. That's why I hated for them to put the little thing, solve for y, you know, as if that's just some trivial little thing out there. No, make this its own step. Not that it matters. All right, next step. This was your number four. This would be my number five. Yes, make the y f inverse. f inverse of x is equal to 5 minus 2x over 3x plus 1. And guess what? We found the inverse, or at least what we think is the inverse. But then what's the last step? Yeah, check it. Verify it. So what would that be? f of? f inverse of x, which do you put in first? Innermost, so that would be f of this thing right here. 5 minus 2x over 3x plus 1. Okay, now your f function is this one up here, right? What does it say do? Start with 5 and subtract from that what's in your parentheses, right? Ooh, I messed that up. And what's in your parentheses is 5 minus 2x over 3x plus 1, okay? And that's over 3 times what's in the parentheses, which is 5 minus 2x over 3x plus 1. And then we add 2 to that. Okay. Ooh, yuck. All right. How do we do something like that? This, in some books, is called a complex fraction. I like to call it a complicated fraction because complex really means you use something else. And what we have to do in something like this is find the least common denominator of all the denominators of both the numerator and the denominator. It was only one, and that's a 3x plus 1, right? And what do you think we're going to do with that? How do you undo a denominator? Multiply. So let's multiply a numerator and denominator, in fact, every term in the numerator and denominator, by this 3x plus 1. Multiply the 5 by that, multiply this by that, multiply this by this, multiply this by this. Multiply everything in numerator and denominator by 3x plus 1. Because so 3x plus 1 over 3x plus 1 is 1. We can do that. All right. This first one, if you can do it sort of backwards there, distribute the 5, and what do you get? 15x plus 5 minus, now here, these will go out. Now, you want to do one step or two steps? You could put what's there in parentheses, or you could go on and clear the parentheses. Clear it? The minus times 5 is minus 5, and minus times a minus 2x is plus 2x. Right? All right. And the denominator. This 3x plus 1 divides out that one. They go to 1. And then you've got a 3 on the outside, so this will be 3 times 5 is... 15 minus 6x plus, and multiply that through, and you get 6x plus 2. Oh, 6x down here, minus 6x plus 6x goes to 0, doesn't it? Hey, that's looking good. Up here, a plus 5 minus 5, that goes to 0. So what are you left with in the numerator? Really? It's what? Which is? 17x over is 17. And guess what that goes to? 
X, ding, 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 it works. Wow, wasn't that great? Okay. Now, guess what we still need to do? F inverse of F. Oh, yeah. Okay. Um, how much time do we have? Say again. Three minutes. I don't think we're going to have time to do F inverse. Do you? I mean, F inverse of F. But y'all can do that at home, can't you? Okay, and I'm sure you will. Uh, so next time, we didn't quite get to finish anyway, so we wouldn't have had the test tomorrow anyway. We'll start next time with example 7. Top of page 89, and we will wrap that up. Let me give you homework. Hey, hey, we still got minutes, right? Homework exercises here will be any of the odds 7 through 13. They're all at Calc Chat. Uh, nines at Calc View. Either's 15 or 17, they're all at, both at Calc Chat, 15's at Calc View, 19's at Calc Chat, any of the eyes 21 to 31, they're all at Calc Chat, 23's at Calc View, 20, I mean 33's at Calc Chat, 35's at Calc Chat, either 37 or 39's at Calc Chat, 41 and 43 are both at Calc Chat, 41's at Calc View, any of the odds 45 to 53, they're all at Calc Chat, 45's at Calc View. Um, and then this is where we were doing today. Okay? Any of the odds 55 through, I would say, 65. Try those. We didn't quite do one like 67, so we'll hold off of that until next time. All those 55 through 65 are at Calc Chat, 61 is at Calc View. And we'll pick up the rest of them next time. Okay? Now, so here's the plan, folks, for those who came in late. Next time we'll finish that last example. I'll give you the rest of the homework exercises. Okay? And then we won't do 1.10. We'll move on and start on 2.1. Okay? The following Tuesday, one week from today, I have a doctor's appointment, and but I will be here at 8.30, and we'll have class for the first 30 minutes. That will be a great time to bring all your questions for Chapter 1. If there's anything in Chapter 1 you're not understanding, that 30 minutes would be a great time to spend reviewing for that. If you don't bring any questions, we'll continue in Chapter 2, okay? We'll go there for 30 minutes, and I have to leave to get to my appointment. All right, then on the Thursday of next week, that's when you'll have the test on Chapter 1, and at, I'll have somebody in here to proctor the test. I have the test already. Uh, you bring with you formula and equation sheet. Remember, you can do that for every test in the course. Formula and equation sheet, whatever you want to do. If you like your own graph paper better than what I'm going to give you, then bring your own graph paper. Bring scratch paper. I highly recommend you turn in scratch work so I can give you as much partial credit as possible. Right? Any questions? So we'll have class on Thursday. Finish one, chapter 1.9. <coughs> give you more homework um, to practice on. Then we'll begin in 2.1 and continue that on Tuesday. Have the test on Thursday. Good deal.